Um, so, one question that kind of constantly bothers many of us in the tech industry, uh, uh, in the country here especially, is like, why do we not have enough tech startups? Why do we not have enough uh, technology products uh, coming out of India? If you look at it, the Silicon Valley is well-known fact. Uh, in fact, this is from very recent stats. Uh, uh, there are almost 60% of the new startups uh, are founded by people of Indian origin. Many of them first generation, meaning they went there to study or went there to work. Uh, and then kind of stayed on. And uh, while Indians in the Bay Area can create global kind of world-class products, why can't Indians in India? And this is a question that bothers uh, many of us. And if you have to look at it, it's not like the cream of the cream went to the US. You take any 100 engineers uh, in the Valley and any 100 engineers in Hyderabad, they're probably very similar profiles. I'm sure the 60 of those 100 are from Hyderabad also. And uh, so uh, they're from a whole mix. I mean, ranging from the top institutions all the way till the most poorly equipped uh, private colleges, and they've just all uh, kind of made it to wherever they are. It's not like the people there are different, right? It's primarily that the, the environment is uh, different. So the opportunity, that's an opportunity that we have, right? We just don't have it today here, but the people are capable of doing it. So that's the opportunity that we have. So in that context, we started, uh, so I moved to Hyderabad in 2000. Uh, I used to work in the Bay Area at the time, and I came here to join a startup. Uh, it was uh, Pramati, a Java app server company. Exciting startup. I was very, very uh, impressed when I first came to know of them just a few months before I moved. We had to move back to Bangalore. My parents were there, indoors were there. We built a house there. My wife was born and brought up in Bangalore. So every reason uh, to be in Bangalore. And then just a few months before the move, I come to know uh, of this company. And then like, things worked out, and uh, I decided to take up the job, talk to my wife. Uh, thankfully, she indulged. And uh, so we came here to join the startup. Long story short, I mean, we went through an exciting journey. Uh, we made a global uh, brand uh, from here. Uh, in a very tough uh, server-side Java uh, space. And uh, the 2002 downturn kind of took a toll on us. We couldn't recover from it, really. It took us two years, and finally, kind of, we had to make some hard moves and uh, start working uh, with a company called Progress, which is my current, uh, the company that I work for currently. So Progress came, uh, licensed a, uh, one of our two products that we had, and commissioned us to build a new product that they were building. And half of the company had to work on that product. And that's what saved the company. The company has since then bounced back, uh, and it's doing very well now. And, uh, but came at a huge price. Half of engineering, uh, I was running engineering at the time, half of engineering had to start working on the, uh, the progress product. So there was a challenge. I mean, the team that I had was in the company, in Pramati, because we had this shared uh, battle cry, uh, so to speak, to create this global product out of uh, India, and which we were doing very well. Uh, while we couldn't make uh, financial success out of the product, we made a fantastic technology success. The product was very, very well known. The company was very well known those days uh, in the server side uh, space uh, globally. And we were competing with the likes of IBM, Oracle, Sun, and others uh, at the time. And um, so that kind of team now, where like, the whole war cry was like, let's create this global product, global success from here. Now suddenly we had to work uh, for this company that's based out of US. And it's almost like a services mode. Though we're working on a new product, it's not our product anymore. So it was a challenge. In that environment, we started working, and, uh, and slowly the whole uh, center became, uh, while this product continued, once we had a development center here. And um, so in that environment, now we had to, I had to figure out a mechanism where like, we can keep everybody in the team excited. We feel as good. We need to find an equivalent substitute for not having our own product. Right? So that was the, uh, the challenge that we were dealing with, creating that environment, creating that success, which is what is going to give us. Nothing short of it is going to make us happy or keep the team excited. We have to create uh, products. Now, the challenge is that in a matrix, we were working in a matrix. The product teams, the initiative owners were elsewhere in one of our other offices. And uh, we were working in a matrix. When you work in a matrix, we don't own the product. And like the natural tendency is to micromanage the team, and which is a killer. I mean, like nobody worth uh, his or her salt is going to stay uh, in that environment. And uh, so that was the challenge. We had to create products uh, for us to feel kind of contented, satisfied, and happy. And at the same time, the environment doesn't allow us to create those products, because somebody else owns the products. We're just working. And uh, so that's where it started. And parallelly, like, while in this little company where we were on 50, 60 of us engineering, we were all very, very kind of driven. Uh, the first time I got to kind of look at the bigger industry was when I started working, uh, when we moved to Progress and kind of started uh, just looking around. Till then, never bothered to pay attention. And, and this was a fact. I mean, today we have about 400,000 people here. 
Uh, but those days, it's already like at least half the number, 200,000 people, and still very, very few good uh, product engineers. Uh, the most of us, most of the industry is doing uh, services. And uh, so we started saying, like, the, the key thing is, like, that's the kind of talent pool that we had, and the key was to change that mindset. And, uh, and that's not easy, uh, regardless of where they come from. Even if they come from a product company, they are working more or less in a services environment. Uh, they're not owning the products, they don't think, they don't own, they don't drive. They just do what they're told. In many cases, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, they're given tasks, even though they may be working on a new feature or a new release or a new product. But somebody else owns and drives it. We're just kind of doing some work uh, one day at a time. And uh, so we have to change that mindset. So that was our challenge. Uh, and like, for many reasons. Uh, reten retention was one uh, primary reason, but also just to have, we have to enjoy what we do. So we start off with like, we have to first make uh, building exciting. So that's the, that's the biggest challenge that we have today. Nobody, if you go to any engineering college, nobody enjoys building. And as engineers, like, we have to build, right? But like, it's all about marks, it's about ranks, it's about exam scores, campus placement, kind of everything else on the mind, but nobody bothers to build. Very, very rarely does anybody build, and that's a problem for us as a product company, because we are building products. If you're not excited about building, we can't build great products. If we can't build great products, then we are failing on our mission to kind of start owning and driving uh, products. So the first thing was to create while we can't change the education system, we can't change who comes into our company, we can change what they do in the company. So the first thing was to try and create a lot of activities in the office. We, again, we can't change what we do until we establish ourselves and can prove to the company leadership that we can do more. We have to make do with whatever we are doing. And within that constraint of doing, in some cases, even on a day-to-day -day task basis, not, thankfully not all teams are like that, but still, even in that environment, while delivering on what we are asked to do, we have to go show uh, more value. So creating excitement around building was the first thing that we started. There's a lot of activities that we used to do in the office uh, where we used to have like hackathons and hack days and like prototyping sessions. When we're doing the work, do something adjacent to the work. While we're working on something that we, has, we can't, that is the primary deliverable that we have. Even as we're working on the, uh, uh, or, or whatever we're working on, parallelly we would just add adjacencies to it, extend what we're doing and create some excitement around work. So that's the first thing we did. The second thing was like, the whole, I mean, in a product environment, uh, in any creative environment, it has to be fun. I mean, if you're not in a fun environment, you can't, you can't, I mean, it doesn't stimulate the mind. So, so we had to make the workplace fun. And, and it's not just workplace fun, we had to make work fun. So almost like we made a very conscious choice that all our celebration will be around the work. It could be a major milestone, could be a difficult week, could be a big customer issue that we solved, could be a big release that happened. Almost, we just don't do, just like that, go out for a get-together. All our get-togethers, all our outings were around work. So that way it kind of, we got the fun, and still, it was a very, very strong message to the team that, like, we celebrate our work. And, and then also, in the office, we had to make sure the, the environment is as, uh, as fun as uh, possible. So it's a very conscious effort uh, and over the years. And now, by and large, it's, it's a fantastic place to work. Uh, many people enjoy. And, and this work fun and fun at work was a key part of it. But to extend further, we had to create an environment that stimulates. If you talk about ideas, we're talking about, like, it has to stimulate. And then we are talking about working in an environment where like, it's not even, if we own the products, it's easy to do anything we want. Like if I'm the initiative owner, anybody in my team, if they come up with an idea, if I think it's good, I can take it forward. But not in the environment, the matrix that we were working. So ideas have to be really, really good, even to kind of convince somebody that's worth doing it. And it's not just an idea, we'll take it much beyond an idea. So, so we had things like an idea cafe. We converted our cafe, the pantry that was there, we completely got the pantry redone and called it idea cafe. And we just created, and the whole ambience was different. Um, we got, uh, the best coffee machine we could find in the city at that time. We got all kinds of board games. We have a video game console there. And, like, and we just said, like, you just go chill out, do anything. I mean, often doing something unrelated to work gets you fantastic ideas at work. And uh, so we have the idea cafe. We have what was just a breakout area with most officers, because we have to break the monotony of the cubicles, you have the breakout areas, which are just a few sofas and a coffee table. We converted that into brainstorming areas. We had a swing and like we got a whiteboard, we got very comfortable chairs. We kind of tried to, and we called it uh, brainstorming corners. People can just go sit on the swing and take a phone call, that's perfectly fine. But often we see people having discussions there. They don't go to a meeting room, just go to these breakout corners, uh, sit on the swing. It's very bean bags and kind of just, it's again an environment to stimulate. So, and then like, we also have to celebrate, we should feel good about what we do, whether it's our regular work or some other ideas. So we had to celebrate, so we do, like, in fact, this Monday we have this 11th anniversary, uh, in fact, yesterday was the 11th anniversary, we have a celebration on Monday. Every year on the anniversary day, we showcase all, every team sets up a small demonstration uh, for about an hour at the, at the monthly all hands. 
and we showcase what an interesting was done by the team. This includes not just the product teams, even our IT team and few other teams that we have non-product teams in the office. Every team showcases something that they did in the last one year that they think was significant. And, uh, and that's one big thing that we do, but everywhere else we get a chance. We have to take pride in what we create. So that's important to stroke that interest and that excitement. So we have to take pride. So the other thing that we consciously do, we have a lot of uh, avenues where we try to showcase. We get a lot of executive visits. Like my boss, the chief product officer, comes at least three, four times a year. When he's here for two days, at least half the time, we have full day back-to-back -back meetings. We start at breakfast, and they kind of hate that part of it, but I don't give it any other way. We, there's a breakfast meeting goes all the way till dinner meeting. And like through the day, like there are some reviews that he would want, like what he would want maybe would take up one fourth of the time. The rest of it is like there are a lot of things that we show. And like whether he benefits or not, the team benefits. There's an excitement around when you show to a CEO staff member, there's an excitement that comes with that. And we get a lot of good out of it also, otherwise. But in the least, there's an excitement when the teams uh, show. So, so showing uh, what we, showcasing what we build is another thing that we very, very consciously do to kind of stroke that pride uh, and that uh, energy. And in the process, we have to, where it matters, if we do 10 things, maybe only two, three matters uh, to the current scheme of things in the company. Remaining seven, eight are just fine if it creates excitement. But there are always few that actually matters. And so we make sure like that gets shown at the right point. We may take it forward. And, like, uh, and then like, that's how we started changing what we do. The first time we got something where like was four years after we started, where we did something like this, which was a Skunk Works project. And then that got into the product. And it became a new piece of a major product line. And it came out of a Skunk Works project and that, when, that, that we showed to the chief product officer when he was visiting uh, at that time. And then he liked it. He went. He took it forward. So thankfully, we had fantastic executive support all through. I mean, a lot of this is possible. It's not enough if we kind of just show there should be someone willing to kind of look at it and do something about it. So we had very good executive support. That helped. But the initiative was from, uh, from our side, from our team. So, and then not just ideas, we had to build idea prototypes. So, so that's another thing we said, like, if just ideas come dime a dozen, well, it's not easy, but it's definitely not enough. We have to take it forward. Uh, so we had a mechanism where we would prototype ideas and we work very closely. We used to take summer interns. So after a few years, we decided, like, we will use the interns, because I, I teach at Triple IT, we have very good rapport with Triple IT. So for a long time, we used to take interns only from Triple IT. And, like, and they're very smart kids. So we use the summer internship to build idea prototypes. Now, it's become so popular. Two years back, we had like, I don't know if you know this, ma'am, we had about 250 uh, students come and take the test. And we take only 10 interns. And the whole pool size between second and third year and MTech first year, uh, in the campus around 500, 550. In a pool size of 50, there are 250 people that came to our office to take a test for summer internships. And that's how, uh, and, and we get fantastic prototypes built. So it's our ideas. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's uh, I think when given the chance, this, this goes on to show, like, when given the chance, they're fantastic minds. I mean, they do brilliant work. Uh, so they do, it's amazing how much they can do. And we just have to tell them a problem, like, say, three or four in the afternoon. They would do a night out so resourceful, would go search, do whatever, come back, and next morning, you're cracked it. And uh, so we get fantastic stuff done. Uh, so the prototypes is a big part, which was one of the key uh, enablers in kind of changing the value uh, and changing what we do. And uh, so we had some, some, some success along the way. Uh, around 2009-10 was where we started, after about four or five years since we started, uh, where we were getting, beginning to get noticed. And like a year later, um, uh, there was somebody from the CTO office, uh, one of the, uh, like he, he was the founder of a company that we acquired, and he moved to the CTO office. He took this exercise to try and find out why we don't innovate and where does innovation happen in the company. And like we didn't know at that time, we were doing what we were doing because we felt it essential just to increase value from us, increase the satisfaction that our teams face. And when he did this study for a couple of months, met a lot of people, and then finally when he presented to the CEO his observations and what we should do, he said the only place, at the time we were uh, in about seven countries. We had, I think, about 12 or 13 development labs. This was the second largest lab in the, uh, the Haribad office at the time. And of those all the 12, 13 labs, the only place where he found any grassroots innovation happening was in Haribad. So, which was a, and we didn't know that I, until he... It was a pleasant surprise for us. Like I said, we had our own reasons to do it. It's, we, didn't, we were not even calling it innovation at the time. And we just felt these are some of the things that we needed to create excitement, get some good ideas. And, and, and then from that point on, we started getting noticed and kind of more started happening uh, since then. So the cross stimulation is something we believe is very important. It's not enough. We can't be crabs in a well. So the cross stimulation is key. So we engage with a lot of events. We host a lot of events in our office. Anybody that asks uh, for a venue, we give it. In fact, when we redid the office five years later, we, the, the spec given to our uh, facilities team was like our lunch cafeteria has to be able to host good quality events. 
and like uh, so it's a fantastic AV system and we host a lot of events it's just a cross simulation not everybody sits in there the fact that we are hosting a hackathon or a seminar or a boot camp uh, like or an open source event just the fact that we're hosting itself is kind of exciting enough some people sit and also benefit from it likewise we go and talk in conferences we encourage our uh, engineers to go very regularly talk we push we kind of do all kinds of stuff we can to make them go talk about our work i mean like uh, the kind of work we do is fantastic work so it's a lot of good stuff to talk about just that most people are either not comfortable or not confident of doing it so we to just nudge prepare and so so we got some very good uh, success doing that and then started actively participating in the ecosystem building exercise that started about 4 or 5 years back today hyderabad has probably one of the best startup ecosystem in the city i mean in the country and it's one of the most networked the amplification that the network provides is very very uh, significant people know i mean anybody like you want to talk to anybody somebody that doesn't know ramana can just second order connection can get a connection to ramana and he would meet them that's the kind of environment we have here which is not there in any, any other city in most other cities there's a clear quid pro quo i will talk to you only if there's something i'm going to get by and large but there's a fantastic network so we were a key part of it me personally and also as a company and i think in the process of building the uh, the network it don't have to work with startups so it has also benefit us a little bit and uh, we have we are a global company most of our customers are in the us and europe little bit on uh, in east asia and australia but not in this region so we never get to meet customers and for a product company to be able to build good products the engineers have to understand what customers do and like we were struggling so finally we said like we have this good trapo startup ecosystem why not we get customers in house so we went made a case just based on that point not that we want to support startups just to say that okay it's going to help us build better products by having some customers in house we made a case and got the incubator uh, kind of approved and so we had the incubator in our office for last year and a half now in fact it was, it was announced by our current ceo 3 years back on his visit he kind of just knew of it i didn't even talk to him yet just before we are having a press meet just before talking to the press uh, he leaned and said like so can we announce incubator here and that's how he announced it happened uh, a year later so when incubator so where we run cohorts only condition everything is free only condition is like they have to build on one of our products we built some more so last year we said like like the in most product companies the cto office and the engineering are generally kind of not you would think they are connected they should be connected but they are not so cto office is more an outward facing uh, function uh, and product group is product group and we said like let's try and change it so we made a case that why not we set up a prototyping group since we do a lot of prototyping already that works on cto office projects so my boss liked it he went talked to cto he liked it so both of them became sponsors it got funded and we got a team in place where we work on cto office prototypes there are almost one or two month prototypes and but it's created again significant awareness a five member team but the awareness it's created in the company for what we do was phenomenal uh, and like it's been a year since we started that and we said that's not enough we just needed to do more and then we said like let's create an entrepreneurship policy very few companies have an entrepreneurship policy and so where are we now like we i think we made reasonable good progress uh, and i think we are by and large an exciting place to work most people that work for us like working we attract good talent so what next um, we are looking at an extended co innovation network so we believe it's important that we co create so like we work with startups we have our own incubator we work on our products we constantly look at startups that we can either oem or license or even acquire and like every time my boss comes that is one out of every two visits he meets one of the startups which i think are relevant and like uh, but unfortunately nothing is closed yet but we constantly look at it and now we are and we work with the uh, academic institutions also though we haven't done any commission projects but we have explored working uh, on some of our technologies and now we believe that this ecosystem that we have we should use to co-create between companies like us through our incubator or otherwise startups and academic institution combine look at how can we co-create product so we are on that process it's a long shot it will happen uh, i'm sure it will happen the next couple of years thank you